and seeing a way to address them, and took significant actions of his own toward that end. His research was extensive. He spoke of it continually. He secured the generator. He secured the water pump. He researched how to fix the generator. He located his vehicle in an unnoticeable area and commenced his attempt by starting the pump. However, he breaks that chain of self-causation by exiting the vehicle. He takes himself out of the toxic environment that it has become. This is completely consistent with his earlier attempts at suicide. In October of 2012, when he attempted to drown himself, he literally sought air. When he exited the truck, he literally sought fresh air. And he told a parent of that attempt. Several weeks later, in October of 2012, again, he attempts through the use of pills to take his life, but calls a friend and assistance is sought and treatment secured. That Mr. Roy may have tried and maybe succeeded another time after July 12th or 13th of 2014 is of no consequence to this court's deliberation. Although some have suggested for this case that the legal principles involved are novel, that is not accurate. Approximately 200 years ago, a man in Hampshire County in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, an inmate at the Hampshire jail, was charged with causing the murder of the man in the next cell. The case is Commonwealth versus Bowen. The law was different in, that, in those days, but some of the similarities existed. The person who ended up taking his life in the Bowen case was named Jewett. Jewett, in fact, hung himself in his jail cell approximately six hours before he was to be publicly hanged for killing his father. Whether Mr. Roy, in this case, would have taken his life at another time does not control or even inform this court's decision. In the Bowen case, where they referred to Mr. Jewett, the person who took his life, as the culprit. The court writes, the culprit, through, though under sentence of death, is cheered by hope to the last moment of his existence. Returning to this case, when Ms. Carter realizes that Mr. Roy has exited the truck, she instructs him to get back into the truck, which she has reason to know is or is becoming a toxic environment inconsistent with human life. She is mindful that the process in the truck will take approximately 15 minutes. Whether that is a true fact is not relevant. What is relevant is that that is her state of mind based upon a text exchange between she and Mr. Roy during the period of June 30th to July 14th. She instructs Mr. Roy to get back into the truck, well knowing of all of the feelings that he has exchanged with her, his ambiguities, his fears, his concerns. This court finds that instructing Mr. Roy to get back in the truck constituted willful and rec I'm sorry, wanted and reckless conduct by Ms. Carter, creating a situation where there is a high degree of likelihood that substantial harm would result to Mr. Roy. 
Miss Carter knows through her own admission that Mr. Roy has followed her instruction. As she indicates in various text messages subsequently created to some of her friends, she indicates that she can hear him coughing and she can hear the loud noise of the motor. The court notes that I looked for independent cooperation of some of the statements that Ms. Carter made to make sure that there was no uh, undue reliance on any one source of evidence. The photos taken at the scene of the crime where Mr. Roy's truck was located clearly illustrate the location of the water pump immediately adjacent to where he would have been sitting in the truck next to his upper torso and his head, thereby giving a good explanation to Ms. Carter's definition that the noise was loud within the truck. Ms. Carter, at that point, therefore, had reason to know that Mr. Roy had followed her instruction and had placed himself in the toxic environment of that truck. At this point in the court's analysis, the court di took direction from a case, Commonwealth versus Levesque. In Commonwealth versus Levesque, it is indicated that where one's action creates a life-threatening risk to another, there is a duty to take reasonable steps to alleviate the risk. The reckless failure to fulfill this duty can result in a charge of manslaughter. Knowing that Mr. Roy is in the truck, knowing the condition of the truck, knowing, or at least having a state of mind, that 15 minutes would pass, Ms. Carter takes no action in the furtherance of the duty that she has created by instructing Mr. Roy to get back into the truck. She admits in a subsequent text that she did nothing. She did not call the police or her or Mr. Roy's family. She knew his location, again, according to a text that she sent, as being at the Kmart Plaza. According to one of her emails and other credible evidence, I'm sorry, according to other credible evidence, the police officers who testified, the location where Mr. Roy's truck was located was approximately one half mile from the public services office of Fairhaven, which included both the fire department and the police department. She did not notify his mother or his sister, even though just several days before that, she had requested his, their phone numbers from Mr. Roy and had obtained them, and had opened a line of communication with Camden Roy on, I believe, July 10th, but just a few days before the events in question. She called no one. And finally, she did not issue a simple additional instruction. Get out of the truck. Consequently, this court has found that the Commonwealth has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Ms. Carter's actions and also her failure to act where she had a self-created duty to Mr. Roy since she had put him into that toxic environment constituted each and all wanted and reckless conduct. And this court further finds that the Commonwealth has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that said conduct caused the death of Mr. Roy. This court does not find that the intentionality necessary for such wanted and reckless conduct is obviated by Dr. Bregan's theory of involuntary intoxication in that the court did not find that analysis correct. Ms. Carter, please stand. This court, having reviewed the evidence and applied the law thereto, 
now finds you guilty on the indictment charging you with the involuntary manslaughter of the person Conrad Roy III. This court further finds that the Commonwealth has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that you are a youthful offender and you are a judge show at this time. You may be seated. That verdict is now recorded and it is in writing as well. Commonwealth, do you wish to be heard? The Commonwealth moves for sentencing, Your Honor. Pardon me? The Commonwealth moves for sentencing. Sentencing is not appropriate at this time. Chapter 119, Section 58 requires that a pre-sentencing report be prepared and given to the judge before sentencing can be imposed. Understood, Your Honor. With that, the Commonwealth would ask that Ms. Carter's bail be revoked and she be taken into custody. And the basis for that request? She's now been convicted of a felony and clearly she's a danger not only to others but uh, based on the testimony to herself. All right. Thank you. Mr. Cataldo, Mr. Madeira, do you wish to be heard on the Commonwealth's request? Yes, I ask you not to revoke the bail, Your Honor. This case has been pending I, uh, for a couple of years now. She showed up each and every time. She's obeyed the conditions, all the conditions that she had of her release. And I do not uh, think that the evidence shows that she is a danger to the public if she's released. Mr. Cataldo, are you willing to inquire your client as to whether she has a passport? Yes, one moment, please. No, she does not have a passport, right. Your Honor. The court notes that, as Mr. Cataldo points out, this case has a long history. To my knowledge, Ms. Carter has never failed to appear. When she was interviewed by the police at the King Philip Regional High School, she was cooperative with that interview. She was cooperative with allowing the police into her home. I believe that revised conditions of bail release will suffice to uh, secure the concerns of the Commonwealth as well as to uh, allow for the completion of the sentencing report before it is done. Consequently, Mr. Cataldo, assuming the client accepts the following conditions, I will allow her to remain on bail. She will have no contact with any member of the Roy family or any of the witnesses who have testified in this case. And by no contact, obviously I mean no texting, no Facebook, no Snapchat, none of those things that provide for any type of direct or indirect communication, including, of course, anything through a third party. She shall not apply for nor obtain a passport. She shall not leave the Commonwealth of Massachusetts except by further order of this court. But I do not restrict that to just me in the event I am not available. A request may be made of any judge who is sitting here in the juvenile court. Commonwealth, recognizing the court's position on this, do you have any other requests as to additional bail conditions of release? No, thank you. All right. Okay. I'm going to ask that the probation sentencing report be provided by July 21st. Can that be done? Yes. Thank you very much, Ms. Taylor. I want the attorneys to understand that it is the position of this judge that sentencing reports prepared by the probation department are for the judge. In fairness, since they I give them careful reflection in coming to a sentencing determination. I will allow the attorneys, as well as any necessary individuals within the district attorney's office, to be provided with one copy that may be read by those individuals that I have just identified. And that Mr. Cataldo, you, Mr. Madeira, and your legal defense team may similarly be provided with one copy. It is not a public document. It is not filed with the clerk's office. And there is no public access to that document. So you are prohibited from disseminating any of the information contained in that sentencing uh, report to any individual other than within your own defense or prosecution team. Now, 
that being done on July 21st, I would like to see if we could schedule a, a, a sentencing hearing, uh, perhaps for the week of July 31st, uh, subject, of course, to the respect that I have for people's vacations for the first week in August. Third, please. I'm sorry, August, August 3. What day is that? Third, Thursday. Thursday. Is that okay, Madam Clerk? That's fine, Judges. All right. And this matter will stand continued to August 3rd for a sentencing hearing. We'll be in recess until that date. Council, I have a copy of the verdict for all of you if you'd like. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. All right.